Good morning, family. Welcome this morning to Bible Way Community Baptist Church, the place where Jesus Christ is still the Lord of all and the Word of God still transform lives. We're excited and delighted that you've tuned in this morning to be a part of our Sunday morning worship service. We hope and pray that things have been going well for you and your family in your neck of the woods. And it was no accident, it was no coincidence that you've tuned in this morning, but it's by the providence of Almighty God. God has something he wanna say and something he wanna do in your life. And so the Lord has directed you to be a part of our worship service this morning. And ladies and gentlemen, on last Sunday, the Lord really moved by his spirit in our service on last Sunday. God really moved, ladies and gentlemen. We are so thankful for his spirit. Um, the, he moved on our uh, uh, worship, our time of uh, praise and worship. He moved on our time of prayer. Uh, our time of preaching. I mean, the Lord was just really moving by his spirit. And we had a wonderful message. And this message we want to bring to you today. It's a message that's entitled three things you need to know. Three things, not a whole bunch of things, but three things, just three things you need to know. But these three things, ladies and gentlemen, makes a world uh, difference. But first, our music ministry is going to come and they're going to minister to us in song. And then I'm going to return with that message. Three things you need to know. All right. So get ready. Get ready. Get ready. And let's have some church. And we'll sing all three stanzas this morning. I heard an old, old story, Victory in Jesus.
Let us pray. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for who you are. The God who hears and you still answer praise. Now, Lord, as I stand behind this sacred desk to preach your sacred word to your sacred people, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. For you are my strength and you are my redeemer. Besides you, there is no other. So speak in such a way that the lost will be saved. The saved will be encouraged and backsliders will come back to you. And if someone in need of a church home, we pray that they will come and even join this morning here at Bible Way. So Lord, we thank you. Now Holy Spirit, have your way. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on and put your hands together. And praise the Lord. Our God is worthy to be praised. I want to thank the Lord at this morning. for the presence of his spirit. Yes, sir. Yes, Thank you. Thank him for his spirit. His spirit is in this place. Thank God this morning for his spirit. Amen. But well, while his spirit is here, I'm going to go on and start preaching so his spirit can use me this morning. If use the choir and, and singing, use the deacon in praying. Then use these ushers this morning, greet us, smiling faces. A smiling faces goes a long way. Amen. And he has used you this morning. Do you know you special to God? When you're not here, you are missed. You miss. Because you're special to God. All right. Uh, you're already st standing to your feet, but put a Bible in your hand. And hold it up like you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and repeat after me this morning. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. If I obey it, I obey it. Blessings, will come. blessings will come. If I disobey it, I disobey it. Curses, will come. curses will come. I am, I am. What, it says I am. what it says I am. I can be, I can be. what it says I can be. I can, do I can do what it tells me to do, me to do. through the power of God. Power of this, is this is God's idea. God's idea. I, believe I believe that God's idea, God's idea is the best idea. The best idea. I, I'm, committed I'm committed to the biggest thing, the, thing. the highest thing, the, thing. the greatest thing, the, greatest the best thing, thing. The best thing. Which, is which is obeying God. Obeying Therefore, Therefore, my mind is made up, my, is made my, up. Heart, is my heart is fixed, my spirit is ready, spirit is ready. To, receive to receive the word of God, word of God. That, will that will transform, transform my, life. my life. Amen. Please remain standing and open up the word of God to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. 
I want to look this morning at verses 15 through 21. Amen. 15 through 21. When you find it, say, I got it. I just want to read 15 through 19, and that'll be enough to get us started. It says, wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what's the riches of his glory and in his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceedingly greatness of his power to us what who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Amen. This morning, I want to talk on the subject, three things you need to know. Amen. Three things you need to know. Right. High five somebody and tell them, Pastor, going to talk about Three things you need to know. Three things. It ain't a bunch of things, but it's three things. Hopefully I can be finished in a timely manner on these three things. Three things you need to know. Welcome to success. Say goodbye to failure. These words were spoken by Marva Collins. Marva Collins was a school teacher who taught school 14 years in the Chicago public school district. She became frustrated though because of the low expectations for the students. Therefore, in 1975, she opened up her own school on the second floor of our house. She called it West Side Preparatory School. Some of the students that came had been labeled by the Chicago Public School as having learning disabilities. But she took those kids and after the first year, every one of her students scored five grades higher on the standardized tests. Marvin Collins, and her school was profiled by 60 Minutes. Good morning, America. Time Magazine, as well as Newsweek Magazine. Matter of fact, President Reagan heard about her and he offered her a position in his cabinet to be Secretary of Education. But she turned him down because she said my place is with the kids. And those kids knew that every day when they walked through those doors at that school, they knew that they was saying welcome to success, goodbye to failure. In the same way, I feel like whenever a person gets saved, 
and get into the church, they can say, welcome to success. Say goodbye to failure. That's what Paul was trying to get the Christians back then as well as us today to know that we are part of something great. When you get into the church, you are part of something great. You can say welcome to success. You can say now goodbye to failure. But so many Christians live defeated lives. Why do so many Christians live defeated lives? It's because they don't know what they have in Jesus Christ. That's why Paul uh, began to pray. Uh, look at this great prayer of Paul. Paul prays his, wherefore I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And look what he prays, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of him. Right at the top of Paul's prayer list. He says, it's the knowledge of God. Oh, he says, I'm praying that God give you wisdom, give you revelation in the knowledge of who God is. Because if you're going to be successful in life, you got to know who God is. If you want to have a good life, you got to know who God is. If you want to have a life worth living, then you got to know who God is. If you want to have a victorious Christian life, then you got to know oh, who God is. Do you know what the problem with our world today? It's not an economic problem. It's not a financial problem. It's a lack of knowledge of God problem. People today don't know who God is. Oh, I know I'm right about it. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 1. He talks about when a nation or people turn their back on God, he talks about they start taking steps down. He said when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. Became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart became darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became a fool and start worshiping and serving creeping things, four-footed animals and bees rather than worshiping the creator. See, whenever you lack the knowledge of God, you don't go up, but you go down. It ain't about evolution and man is getting better and better and better. No, it's devolution. He's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah, Paul says when we turn our back on God, you start worshiping idols. That's idolatry. You done took a step down, but it don't stop there. He says you get into sexual immorality, but it don't stop there. He says you get into homosexuality, but it don't stop there. You keep on going down until you get a bad mentality. And that's what's wrong with our world today. They got a bad mentality. They don't have the knowledge of God. And that's why Paul says, I'm praying for you that you get this knowledge of God. Because it's not enough to be saved. You got to know how God operates in your life. The Bible says that, that Israel, they knew God's work. They saw the miracle. But the Bible says, but Moses says, I want to know your ways. It's not enough to know about his works. You got to know his ways. Lord have mercy. You 
got to have the knowledge of God. Amen. Oh, let me run to the Bible on you. Uh, over in Hosea 4 and 6, says, my people perish. Yeah. We ain't talking about worldless folks. We're talking about church folks perishing. Because they don't have the knowledge of God. Paul goes on. He keep on praying. Look at this prayer. He's praying that the eyes of your understanding been enlightened. <laughs> Even though you're saved, you're still somewhat blind. It's like having cataracts on your eyes. If, you, if any of you have ever had cataracts, you know that you can't see uh, that good. It's like a film over your eye. Things kind of is distorted there. Uh, Sometimes they can even go uh, darker. Uh, you can even end up get being partially blind. Or you can end up being totally blind. Uh, but we live in a day and age where you can go to a doctor and the doctor can take those cataracts off where you can see clearly. In the same way, we got a doctor too. You can be spiritually blind and got some spiritual cataracts, but I know a doctor that can take off. Dr. Jesus, through the power of the Holy Ghost, he can take off those cataracts. Well, you can see clear. And this is what Paul is praying for. He's praying, even though you saved, he says, I'm praying that you get enlightenment. That you know and look, know three things. And all three of these things, this is easy this morning. Start with what? Notice, notice, notice what he says here in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And what the riches of this glory of his inheritance and saints. And what is the exceeding the greatness of the power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Did you see those three what's there? Because I'm building my sermon on these three uh, what's. And I'm going to take all three of these huts, uh, what's uh, off the wagon this morning. And if everybody help, it shouldn't take too long. We want to unload this morning. You need to know. The first thing he said we need to know is God's calling. We need to know God's calling in our lives. See, are y'all with me, by the way? Notice what he says here. Notice what he says here. He says that you may know what is the hope of his calling. The hope of this calling. Now we got to slow it down here. I don't want nobody to trip over this word hope. Because the way the world used this word hope, it's not how the Bible used the word hope. The word, uh, the, the world used hope as wish for thinking. I hope I get a bicycle for Christmas. I hope I get me a cell phone. The latest one. I hope that I can get little boy, this girl here. The prettiest girl in the classroom. I hope I can get her. That's wish for thinking. That ain't what the Bible is talking about when it talks about that kind of hope. That kind of hope is built on uncertainty. But what he's talking about is biblical hope, which is built on certainty. It's a sure reality of future things. It's certain of it. Christianity 
is not a hope so religion. A uh, maybe so religion. But it's a no so. It's a no so faith. And this is what Paul is saying. I hope that you know the hope of your call. I hope you know that God done called you. Amen. Why is that? Until you know without a certain of a doubt that you have been called from darkness into light. You're going to keep playing in the dark. You better know that God done call you. Because when you know that God want to use my life for something, you leave these other things over here. And you go on and start walking in your calling and you start preparing for whatever it is that God done call you to. Oh, I know I'm right. Go with me. Go with me. Go with me over towards the end of the Bible to, to 2 Peter, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at, look at what he says in 2 Peter. Are you with me? They're going to show it on the screen if you can't, can't find it. You can write it down and read it when you get home then. Hey, amen. Because it's getting cloudy and I want to try to unload before it starts raining. Verse 3, verse 3, it says that Corinth, uh, as his divine power has given unto us all things. Did you see? We got everything that pertain to life and godliness. But you will only know you got it through who? The knowledge of him. If you don't know that you already got it, you'll be hunting for it. For stuff that you already got. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly. We keep stumbling across that word. And precious promises. That by these ye may be partake of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. <laughs> How many of you know whenever you fall into sin, most of the time, it's, it's some lust involved. You was doing good until you start lusting after something. Let me, let me, you got tripped up. I, I know why you quit reading the Bible. I know why you quit coming to church. You got tripped up by lust. Let me go on. That's another sermon for another time. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience and to patient godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity or love for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but he that lacketh these things is blind even though he's saved, he's blind and cannot see a fall and has forgotten. What did he forget? That he was purged from his old sin. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, you shall never fall. Welcome to success. Say goodbye. To fail. When you know that God done called you. 
You start adding stuff into your life. You start getting this, getting this, and the stuff that you don't need, you start taking that out of your life. I can remember when I first started playing basketball in the seventh grade. I made the team. My brother, my Miller brother, when he found out I made the team, he said, well, we're going to work on some things. He was like my coach. I had a coach at school, but I had a coach at home. Uh, my brother was one of the best basketball players in the neighborhood there. He said, we're going to work on some things. And he would take me out there to the court. We had a basketball court there on the side lawn there. And we started working on some things. He said, I want you to work on your right hand dribble. Then I want you to work on your left hand dribble. He said, then I want you to work on your stop and go move. I want you to go with the ball, then I want you to bag it up. I want you to go with it, then I want you to bag it up. Then I want you to cross it over. I want you to work on your cross. So we would work on all different kinds of things. Yes, but then because my brother was six years older than me, he left and went up north to get a job up there. But he stayed in touch with me. And he would always ask. He said, Mama said that y'all played the other night. How many points you score? I said, I just scored eight. Oh, Timmy, what, what, what happened? What happened? I said, well, they was playing with a new ball. And that new ball was so slippy. Every time my hand was sweaty and stuff. He said, what you need to go do, go get sweatbands. Go get your sweatband so that, that sweat won't get all on your hand. Then he would call again, and I would tell him, I just hit 12. What's 12? Tell me what's wrong. I said, sweat was getting all in my eyes, Reuben. <laughs> he said, go back to the store there and get your sweatband. You know, remember Willis Reed? He used to wear a sweatband there when he planned. Yeah. And I would go get. If I would tell him, you know, well, I failed the other night, Reuben, and I skint my knee, and I couldn't hardly play. That, that happened in the first quarter and the rest of the game. I wasn't hardly no good. He said, go back to the store there and get you some knee pads. <laughs> get you some knee pads. Then I told him, you know, I didn't score that many points. He said, what was wrong? I said, my back went out. My back went out. He said, go get you a back brace. Go get you a back brace. Wear it in practice and stuff, because we can't have that. The team is counting on you. In other words, whatever excuse I gave, he didn't accept it. There was no excuse for failure. And in the same way, God has a whole bunch of stuff that he done gave to you. And whatever you lacking in your life, you just need to go get it and add that into your life. There's no excuse for failure. It should be welcome to success. Saying goodbye to failure. So that's the first thing. First thing we need to know is God's calling. But the second thing it's God's inheritance. God's inheritance. Let's go back over to Ephesians. I want you to see it at your own Bible. Look at what he says here in verse number 18. We want to milk verse number 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what's the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Notice he says the glory of his inheritance. Now let me slow it down because people get tripped up here because there, there's a couple of ways we could interpret this. His inheritance. And some theologians and good theologians say that what we're talking about here is Christ's inheritance. It's what he get out of the deal. What do he get out of the deal? He get the bride of Christ. He gets the church. 
you know, uh, because in a wedding, the preacher asks the question, who gives this woman away in matrimony? And the father say, I do. And he takes a seat. He steps back, but this man steps up and he grabs the woman by the hand because this is what he getting. And that's what a lot of people say. They say that the father has given Jesus or have given the church to be the bride to Jesus. And you can't really argue with that. Matter of fact, Brother Howard even read that this morning. I say, look at God. <laughs> Psalms 33 and 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. So you can't argue with them now. But I believe that it's on the other interpretation where it's talking about our, the church, inheritance what we get in the deal because the father in this wedding he comes even though we don't ask the question who gives this man away it's implied and, and so God has given Jesus to us and everything that he has Then we read it last week. We are joint heirs. See, I can tell you like that better than the other way around, don't you? Yeah, but because that's the way we're even teaching it right here in the text. Right here in the text. Remember last week, I, I, I talked about verse number 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. And then in verse number 14, it says, which is the earnestness of our inheritance. Yeah. So it's talking about what we're getting in the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's it. It's talking about uh, what we're going to get when we get to the other side. Yeah. Now, a lot of people say that's what's wrong with y'all Christians. Y'all always got your eyes in the sky. You're so heavenly minded, you ain't no earthly good. That's what's wrong with y'all Christians. But if the truth be told, I ain't really never met a person like that. That they are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. But I done met folks who are so earthly minded that they are no good earthly as well as heavenly good. I know I'm right about it. Yeah, because the problem is people who have a self-centered life forget about the afterlife. They just so focus on their life, they don't even think about nobody else's life, and they don't think about their afterlife. Even preachers today done got sucked in to this prosperity theology where they are preaching a self-centered gospel. Where you can name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. They are so earthly minded. They are no earthly as well as heavenly good. And, and the afterlife is not even in their theology no more. Very seldom do you hear preachers talk about heaven other than at a funeral or hell. It's, it's almost like the church done got rid of the afterlife talking about this life. 
it's, it's, it's like that old lady that had two buckets. One bucket had some fire in it. The other bucket had some water in it. And as she was walking down the road, she met a man and the man said, old lady, uh, what are you doing with that, uh, those buckets there with the water and the fire? She says that fire is to burn up heaven and the uh, water is to put out the fire in hell. See, if people had their way, they would get rid of heaven and hell because they enjoying earth so much. They're getting rid of the afterlife because they're living self-centered life. When you live in self-centered life, you ain't got time to think about no afterlife. But somebody say, well, what difference do it make? It'll make a world of difference. It makes a world of difference. See, you got to have a Christ-centered life. Because in a Christ-centered life, you're going to have a balanced life. Yeah. Matter of fact, I got to get y'all involved in this to help me. Because see, when I went to seminary, actually Bible college, the professor said, what you got to do, you got to have a newspaper in one hand, but you got to have a Bible in the other hand. <laughs> see, today if I was teaching, I would say you got to have a computer in one hand keep you in touch with what's going on on earth but you also got to have the Bible in the other hand to prepare you for the next world to come so you got to have a computer in one hand and you got to have a Bible in another hand and you're gonna have a well-balanced life oh somebody still ain't feeling me so that's all right let's do this what I want you to do, I want you to put your hands together like this. Here. Scratch your arm out, point your finger. Now, touch your fingers there. Should, everybody should have a V. Amen. All right, now, what I want you to do, keep your eyes on both of your fingers, but I want you to gradually widen it. Gradually widen it. Keep your eyes on both of them now. Keep your eyes on both fingers. Widen it out. Keep your eyes on both fingers now. <laughs> All right. Now that's tension there, I know. There's some tension. But you got to keep your eyes on both of these worlds. And they are worlds apart. Yeah. You got earth over here to your left. But you got heaven to your right. And if you take your eyes off either one of them, you're going to slip. I know I'm right. Don't you remember what ASAP did over in Psalm 73? What did, what did ASAP say in Psalm 73 verses 2 and 3? He says, my feet were almost gone. My step had almost slipped for I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He said, I almost slipped because what happened? He took his eyes off what God got in store for him and started looking at what man got. And he says, he almost slipped. <laughs> what is I'm doing? I'm slipping and I'm sliding going back to where I was. <laughs> See, that's what happened. When you take your eyes off the prize, well, it ain't long before you start slipping back into your old ways and your old bad habits. He said, I almost slipped. Almost, it, it almost got me because I was envious of the wicked. In other words, he was envious of their stuff. He saw folks uh, having stuff that he didn't have. And that can happen to us, ladies and gentlemen. 
If you ain't careful, you'll start being envious of folks that got some stuff. They got better stuff than you got. Why them people got three cars? I ain't got one good car. Why them people got a nice big house? I ain't got no nice house like that. And I'm serving the Lord all the time. Why they wearing nice clothes? And I ain't got no nice clothes. Be careful, because it won't be long before you start slipping. Matter of fact, it sounds like those are persons that slipping. He said it wasn't until, verse number 11, he said it wasn't until I went to church. I went in that sanctuary, and when I got in that sanctuary, he said, I understood their end. In other words, he understood where they was heading without Jesus. I don't care what a man got right now. What is he going to have in the end of the day? In other words, he quit feeling sorry for himself. And he started feeling sorry for those rich folks who ain't got Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you don't believe nothing else, believe this. Quit being sorry for yourself. And start being sorry for these folks that don't know Jesus. If Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and all those other rich folks who seem to have it all and they flung it all, if they don't know Jesus, they're going to go from the rich house to the poor house. Oh, but when you know Jesus in the pardon of your sin, you may be in the poor house today, but one day you're going to be in the rich house. Oh, I know I'm right about it. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house is many mansions. I'm going there and I'm going to prepare a place for you. You want to make sure that you don't take your eyes off of heaven. Looking at what folks got on earth. Amen. Quit worrying about what folks have. Amen. And think about what you have. Amen. Because what you have is better Amen. than what folks have. Amen. You ready for number three? Yes, We've looked at God's calling. God's inheritance. Number three, God's power. You need to know God's power. Look here in the text. Notice what he says, and he really goes strong and hard on this. Look what he says here, verse 19. And what is the exceedingly great, and look at that word, exceedingly. It goes way beyond the norm. That's what we're talking about when some is exceedingly. It goes way beyond the norm. The exceedingly greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Amen. Paul wants us to understand God's power. Focus on his power. Amen. God's power is what's important, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Uh, uh, when Paul talks about God's power, he points to the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Amen. 
See, the problem is we take too much credit. That's why we don't appreciate God's power. We take way too much credit. We go to church, we give the preacher our hand and give God our heart, then we go home and brag. I walked the aisle, I shook the preacher's hand, I got saved. See, it's I, 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 I. We got our trouble there. See, what I'm doing, I'm reading my Bible. I done said my prayers. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm in the amazing race. I'm going to church all 52 Sundays this year. It's all about what I'm doing. And we're taking the credit. But do you know, we got to give God all the praise. Why is that? Because what can a dead man do for himself? And when you go to chapter 2, that's Paul's whole argument once you get to Ephesians 2. Look at, look at verse 1. He says, and you has he quickened who was dead in trespasses and in sin. It wasn't none of you that got, that saved yourself. You was dead. But you say, but you say wait a minute, pastor. I, I did. I put my faith in. Well, look at verse number 8. Chapter 2, verse number 8. Look what it says. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Even the faith that you had to put in Jesus, God said, I got to take the credit for it. I gave you that. See, not only, see, a lot of people think that once I get saved, we say, thank you, Jesus. Now I can make it from here. I can make it. Thank you. I'm saved now. They're gone. It's just like the watchmaker. The watchmaker, he'll make a watch. He'll wind it up. Then he'll set it aside. And he'll go do something else. That's what a lot of people think. That's how God works in our life. God, he comes like that watchmaker and he makes our life brand new again. And then once we get born again, then he goes on off and do something else. That ain't biblical Christianity. Once God come into your life and start working on you, Philippians 1 and 6 says, be in confidence of this very thing that he that began a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ when he take you home to be with glory. See, you can't even keep yourself saved. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit to keep you saved. How many of you know God is a keeper? That's why Jude says, now to him who's able to keep you from falling. He's a keeper. That's why David said that he needs a slumber, not sleep, because he's a keeper. That's why he said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He lead me besides the still waters restores my soul and then when you jump down there to the end he says goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever he's a keeper Do you know what the problem is why well, we can't give him the praise, though? Can, 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 now, y'all know I love you. It's because we are really ashamed 
of our invisible God. Yeah. Because see, the world, they can point to their gods. When the people would come to Ephesus, they could point to their God. That big old tall statue of Diana. They could point to her. She was in this magnificent temple. One of the great wonders of the world. And when folks would come there, they would point and they would brag about their God. What about y'all Christians? We ain't seen your God. But we got a God. We can, they were saying we can see our, our God. See, that was the problem with the children of Israel. They had a God, but when Moses went to the mountaintop, they said, we don't know what done happened to Moses. Uh, we need a God we can see. And so they, they made a golden calf. And they start having a party. They start dancing because we got a God now we can see. Same thing is repeated uh, over in Samuel. They said, give us a king so we can be like the nations. Wait a minute, y'all already got a kingdom. But he's invisible. We can't see him. But now we got one that we can be like the nation. I don't want to talk too much about them people in there because they dead and gone. We make the same mistakes today. We are ashamed of our God. We want something we can brag on. So we, we show people our car. Did you see my car? And that car become an idol in your life. Did you see my clothes? See these clothes here? The clothes become an idol. In my see my house here? The house become an idol in your life. And then we start getting gadgets to go in our house and stuff. Uh, like Alexis, turn on the television. <laughs> Alexis, cut the lights on there, Alexis. Come on, Alexis, cut the, cut the music on. Get this song here for me, Alexis. <laughs> We get all excited. Did you see? Did you, did you see what is, what's happening here? We getting excited over stuff that we can do. And all that's doing is making us lazy. Yes, they got a God that they can see. But the God's got eyes. But he couldn't see him. That God had ears, but he couldn't hear when they call. He got a mouth, but couldn't talk. Got feet and legs, but can't walk. Got hands and arms, but they can't reach out and save. But not so would I, God. Our God, he got eyes and he can see. He got ears and he can hear. He got a mouth and he can talk. He got feet and he can walk. He got hands and arms and he can reach out and save. Because we serve a true and a living God. And Paul said, you want to see some power? Let me show you this power. The invisible God became visible and stayed on this earth 33 years and he died for your sins. And he died for my sin. And he let us know that he done it. He was always in control. Because he told Pilate, no man take my life. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I'll bring it back up again. And Paul said that's exactly what he, uh, happened. He died, but he rose again, and he's seated today on the right hand of God. And it said, and he far 
above every principality. He's far above every might. He's far above every power. In other words, no demon is either in the same neighborhood with him. He's so high. Old folks used to say, he's so high, you can't go over him. He's so low, you can't go under him. He's so wide, you can't go around him. He's a big God. And nobody ought to be ashamed of that kind of God. Because our God can do what no other. Can do. He became invisible. He was invisible. He came visible, but he went back. And there's a man, a visible man sitting in heaven. And that's my Savior, the Lord Jesus. So that's Paul's argument. If you want to see power, look at the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Because can't nobody else do that but Jesus. As I come to a close, Sister Wibbert and I, we was watching this movie the other night called I Believe. And what this movie uh, was about, it was about this nine-year-old uh, that was in school and the teacher gave him a some homework, research paper to do. And the little boy, in order to do the research, he got online, the computer. And he started trying to get his lesson, but he stumbled across the Bible. And he had never read the Bible before, so he started reading the Bible. And the Bible fascinated him. So the next morning, he couldn't wait to get up and go and tell his mom and dad. And he said, mom and daddy, guess what I did last night? I read the Bible. I saw the Bible on the computer and I read the Bible. His daddy, who was reading the newspaper, put the newspaper down and said, listen, boy, we don't want you to read that Bible no more. <laughs> say, in this house, we don't read the Bible because we don't believe that there is a God who wrote that Bible. So, no, we don't, we don't believe in God, and so I don't want you to ever read the Bible no more. But that didn't stop that little boy from reading the Bible, because how many of you know once God put his hook in you? You, you, you I mean, it's just so fascinating, you ain't never seen nothing like this. So he went to school and he told his little friend, and, uh, this little girl, she was an outcast uh, named Becky and he started telling Becky and Becky became curious about the Bible. Uh, and to make a long story short, God began to start turning hearts, uh, start doing various miracles and stuff from turning uh, these folks who was atheists to being skeptics. Uh, they, first they, they, they said it, it, it is no God, but now they are saying, well, it, it, it may be. It may be a God. Let's check him out. And so little boy had invited him to go to church with him. And so uh, they had made it there to the church and they had gotten out the car and they was on their way to the church and little, little Becky, the neighbor, was with him too. And so as they was going, all of a sudden there, you could hear a car driving up real fast, tires squealing, and, and that was Becky's father, and he jumped out the car, and he, he ran on over there, and he got Becky, and he says, listen, uh, boy, quit uh, brainwashing my child, talking about this God and this Bible. And says, I don't want you to ever talk to her about God and the Bible again. And he got ready to grab Becky and turn away, but he didn't know there was a hit out on his life. And so uh, uh, the man shot, uh, but the bullet was supposed to have been for that man, Becky's father, but it ended up hitting Becky. And Becky fell over backwards. And she began to have her last breath. And everybody fell down trying to comfort Becky and telling Becky, don't die, Becky, don't die, Becky. 
But Becky closed her eyes and she went lifeless. And little Brian, that little nine-year-old mama, says, oh, I wish there was something that we could do. And little Brian, that little nine-year-old, said, mama, there is something we can do. He said, we can pray. And that little boy started praying. And he said, God, uh, restore Becky, heal her body and restore her in Jesus' name. It wasn't long after that that let Becky's eyes open up. Yes. Not only did it open up, Becky sat up. But not only did Becky sat up, Becky stood up and started walking. And it was like she hadn't even got shot. You didn't even see a blood stain or anything. And so the family said, well, let's go on on the church then. And so everybody started going to church. And then when Becky's daddy saw them going to church, he got in line too. And he started going to church. See what that story tells me. That our God can do what no other power can do. That's why we need to know his call know his inheritance and know his power and you will never ever be ashamed let's pray father we thank you for this word now take this word and use it to bring on and glory to your name in Jesus' name we pray, amen.